Yeah, and welcome to the show. I know. Welcome. Thank you for having me in person. This is uh, awesome. In person, we're recording in a podcasting studio in Melbourne. And I honestly feel like Joe Wogan. <laughs> So I'm very tempted to just open the conversation with, so how are you today? Is that how Joe starts the podcast? Yeah. He usually just um, goes into it since it's long form and they don't have an ending, so it can take up to three hours. They just start wherever. Oh, wow. Well, um, you're ho hoping Spotify now picks you up for a big multi-million dollar podcasting deal? Yes. So Spotify, if you're listening, <laughs> I'm up for it. <laughs> you're up for it? Yes. And um, today we're going to speak about team performance and games. And I can read your t-shirt in the game, which is the name of your company. And you've been on the show before. So what does in the game mean to you? Ooh, what does it mean to me? So many things if we go... I mean, big, 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 big... It's, um, I guess it's my business. And I think I've, I was having this conversation with someone the other day. And when you, when you start a business, it is... It's a part, a part of you and an extension of you. So part of, in the game, what does it mean to me? Well, it's an extension of who I am and what makes me me. Um, so there's that part, which is the less tangible part, I guess, uh, to describe. And then uh, tangibly, I think in the game, I've bounced this around because the name of the business came up. It was more of a random generation. And then I think over time, It's evolved to get its own own meaning. Um, I think the if I go the the main thing for me within the game, I think over time has been to succeed and perform at anything. You need to bring people into the game, <clears throat> and I think that's ultimately kind of what I've landed on in terms of its meaning for the type of work that I do. It's about bringing people into the game, and uh, and it's funny to onboard them, bring them on the board. And which makes me think of a board game. Oh uh, yeah, well, and this is the funny thing. It's it's spun out. So it's obviously got the game reference, and that talks back a little bit about how I do things. I think in the game also has this as aspect of the mental side of things. So being in the game and being present. Mm. Um, so Instead, over time, it's kind of evolved. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of picked up a few different different meanings. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And you and you mainly focus on team performance, team building. And I recently, I recently gave a training for coaches and trainers about facilitation. And the big question was, so what's the difference to team coaching? So when you think of team building and the work you're doing, would you consider it facilitation or coaching or training? And where do you see the difference? Yeah, and actually, the, I even to throw something else into the mix, I actually talk a lot about what we do as team development. And I think team building is the easy way to describe it for most people to get. Um, so if you're talking to someone that's not in our space um, and you say, look, it's, it's a version of team building what we do. People kind of get it. Team development is a little bit abstract for them. But um, when I'm talking to people like us, I go, it's, I, I consider what in the game does is team development. And really, for me, that's about getting, you know, looking at a group and getting them to work more effectively together. Ultimately, you know, so that they can perform better, they can grow together, they can come up with, you know, better ideas together. And I also say when you have that, that team also then creates a bit of a magnetic culture as well. So then it, it also attracts great people to the team and it also keeps them there as well. It's a long winded answer, but I kind of look at it as team development is probably, I feel like a better description of what, mm. what we do. I then don't get too caught up in, is it facilitation? Is it coaching? Um, for me, the personally that distinction doesn't doesn't matter too much um yeah yeah and i interesting i've never thought of the distinction between team building and team development but team building almost feels like okay it's a new team so we need to build something from scratch but if something is already there then team building feels like there's something lacking mm as opposed to team development where you build on top of something that already exists. That already exists, yeah. And I think the other part as well as team building, I think has some negative connotations associated with it. You say to someone, hey, we're going to do some team building stuff. And Usually goes, oh. to a person in a team is ro rolling <laughs> the eyes. Oh no, what are we going to do? What are you going to force me to do? And I feel like it's got a whole bunch of negative stuff associate, associated with it. And for me, the development piece also is it's not just a one-off intervention. I'm really 
not a big fan of, hey, let's just do one workshop and that will fix everything. For me, mm. it's an ongoing process. It's, uh, there's rhythms and rituals that a team should be undertaking consistently to develop and, and perform. And so that, that I think that's a, probably another reason why I, I, I like the term team development better than team building. And I would like to, to pick up something that you just said. Um, that team building has a negative connotation because everyone thinks of, are we going to... It will be a workshop and <laughs> are we going to play silly games? Yes. <laughs> so when I think of team building, oh, are we going to play silly games? And here we are <laughs> speaking about team development and your company name is in the game. Yeah. So what's the difference between the air quotes, silly games that everyone is afraid of <laughs> <laughs> and then you call it team development and still you're playing games? Still playing games. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh no. It's just rebadged it and uh, called it something different. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the way I look at it is there's nothing wrong with silly games necessarily. So I think it's all about picking the right type of thing for the right right time. And I think there is a time and place to do more lighthearted things that are less less serious. So there, there is a place for that. But I feel like often organisations think that's it and that's all there is to growing and developing a team is hey we'll just get everyone together and we'll have you know a social event every, once a month and that will help the team perform really well and I go I, I, it doesn't it's it's a very surface level sometimes those um, uh, let's call them silly initiatives or light-hearted initiatives they're often very surface level and they don't have a long-lasting impact um, and in fact actually they're often not done very intentionally in organizations and that can actually worse make the issue worse so let's take the example of friday drinks as a classic mm -hmm. nearly every organization will have friday drinks you know in the classic good old days where everyone was coming in it was like four o'clock on a friday well you've all of a sudden four o'clock on a friday so anyone that has any responsibilities that are to do with friday evenings can't take part some people don't drink and all of a sudden you start creating these clicks and it's mm -hmm. the intentions are fine they're good we want to bring people together socially they can connect But if they're not intentionally designed, they end up making the issue worse. So I've gone off on a big tangent, but I think the difference between some of the team development stuff and the lighthearted stuff is it's looking at ongoing conversations that teams should be having to help increase or improve the way they work together to have a longer lasting impact on team performance. And so you mentioned conversations. Mm. Um, and then... And games. So how do conversations and games fit together? And I, I find your example of the Friday drinks um, very compelling, especially when we speak about inclusivity. Mm. So what if someone doesn't drink? Um, and how do we deal now with remote teams? Um, maybe the Friday drinks are the only way to bring people into the office, But is it really the right, yeah. the right incentive? Doesn't it need some team development first so that um, the team c wants to come into the office without the drinks? It's a, a really good point. It's don't just rely on that one surface level initiative. Actually lay the foundations, lay the groundwork. And then some of those things that you want to do, like bring people in, there's, it's more compelling for people to, to do it. Yeah. Mm. So where, how does it then work if you say that team development is not just one workshop it's not the silly games just to have everyone kind of laugh and connect but to to build some deeper structures or where do you start is it then important to know the personality types of all the team members yeah and i think that's certainly a a decent starting point so i think For me, often the work, the entry point often is, look, let's focus on interpersonal connection. That's usually the one of the best places to start because I find by starting on interpersonal connection, you're building trust. And we know by building trust, that's got a lot of um, positive knock-on impacts. As soon as I know that the person I'm talking to, they are a person. They're not, you know, I truly believe most people aren't being annoying on purpose you know they're a person they're, they've got their own goals and as soon as I start connecting with someone to go oh that person they play basketball on the weekends you know they love going to um, out to see their family on Sundays to have a dinner and as soon as I start understanding more about that person and who they are those issues I have I realize they're not trying to do it purposely to annoy me that person is a person they've got their own goals they've got their own objectives I you start trusting their intentions more 
and then you can start having more productive conversations about what's going well and what's not. So I often say more connection orientated mm. um, is a great place to start. I do think some of the team types, team styles, team personality stuff is a part of that. I think if you can start understanding that me and you, we're maybe different from the way we see things. Again, it humanizes that aspect of mm. it's not you're trying to annoy me. It's that you look at the world differently to how I look at it. And actually, if we look at the bigger picture, that's a good thing. Yeah, That's actually going to be better for the team. Exactly, because a team team needs to have complementary angles Absolutely. to see what, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that high level of cognitive diversity. So the more we can have that in a team, it's going to be better for how the team performs and comes up with ideas. But it's a little bit more awkward because if everyone's the same, it's much easier. Yeah. But it's not better Yes, from an outcomes point of view. Yeah. And it's cognitively, it makes total sense. Mm. Emotionally, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just hard work. Yeah, it's harder work. Yeah. And, and then what also comes to my mind is that the annoying person is usually not about their personality type or about that person, but it's about me, how I perceive that person, because this person triggers something in me. Yeah, for whatever reason. <laughs> right? yeah. That reminds me of my childhood when I <laughs> never got to play with this one toy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I think to, to get the awareness um, in the team members, that to appreciate each other for who they are, um, and find commonalities. So this makes a lot of sense. So if I understand correctly, you would start with the interpersonal level. So the person behind the role to create connection. And then would you look at what works or what doesn't work? So I think even with that, looking at the interpersonal connection piece, and I'd, I'd, I call it kind of meaningful connection. So I think, you know... Um, That needs to be ongoing. It can't just be, hey, we've done it once and that's it, it's done. I think it needs to be an ongoing focus. And I think this is probably where most organizations go wrong is they might do something like a team styles and they do that and everyone's like, oh, I can see why this happens. And then they, you, you get maybe a short-term boost from that because people are really aware. And if we don't pick that up again, people just get back into their old ways of doing things, which I think is perfectly natural. So I think they're the connection piece needs to be an ongoing activity. Now you can mix up how you get people to connect. You might do a team styles thing one time, you might do something else another time, but it needs to be an ongoing focus. Um, so I think, I don't, I think my, my view's grown to be, it's not a, it's none of this stuff is linear. So we can't view it as a linear step one, step two, step three, step four. Mm -hmm. uh, connection's a good place to start, but you could start from another place mm. as well. And before I I ask about the games, <laughs> because I think that's a good uh, entry point, what do you think of um, personality tests, these MBTI? MBTI, right? You, I could go on a really big tangent here, so you can, you can <laughs> cut me off if you want to. Okay. But, uh, small tangent. Yeah, I'm small really tangent. curious because I think a lot of the listeners <laughs> have done or used one of those tests and I would just be curious about your honest opinion well and the reason i was like i got a big tangent is this is where my career started out was in personality assessment mm. so uh started out in that space um and i think like if we go if we keep it really broad you know there's two ways to approach how we measure personality you've got the type-based tools so things like mbti disc hbdi there's a whole bunch of tools which will say hey You either fit in this box, you're this color, you're these combination of letters. And then there's these trait-based tools, which will basically say, look, there's 32 traits of personality and you fit somewhere on a scale across those 32. Um, and immediately you can see there's a big difference. There's one which is very simple. You get into a box, very easy to understand. And one which is very nuanced and, and complex because you've got 32 traits, they all kind of interplay and there's a... Um, it, you know, almost like an infinite combination mm -hmm. of personality traits that come together so it's not so linear and clear-cut which makes sense so that makes more sense and that's probably more like how personality operates than your one certain type but, but. the benefit of the type-based tools is it's if someone has like a team has no idea about these things they're like it's such a good entry point into talking about personality so I actually even though I'm not a huge fan of those type-based tools I use them because it's a great to start the conversation mm. around We're all different in this room. We all bring something different to the table. 
let's talk a little bit about where those differences emerge. What does that mean for how we interact with one another? What works and what doesn't? Where does it cause conflict? And what can we do, you know, from a style flex perspective at an individual level to adapt better to the team? It's great for introducing that conversation. Yeah. But as a tool to really deeply understand yourself and your personality, the trait-based tools are much better. And the only thing, other thing I'll add to that without going too far off is I think sometimes just relying on the tools it also underplays the impact of your context and situation. So I think sometimes people are like, ah, oh, this is what it's told me. But I think the environment and situation has such a big impact on how those traits play out as well. So it's, it's super complicated. And I think sometimes there's a tendency to simplify these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. What just crossed my mind is, um, A, how much information do we actually need about everyone's personality type? Because, of course, we are very curious about our own, mm. but how much do we need to know about our co-workers? So maybe it's actually good to keep the complexity simple unless it's for the interaction between the team leader and their staff. And the other thing that just crossed my mind is the impact of teen dynamics because I can imagine and maybe that's too far-fetched but when I think of family systems mm. very often in a family as a child we take on the role that is actually left out so everyone has a role to play and however what our personality is we we take that up And I can imagine that in a team, if there is a free role, someone would be rather taking that up, although it's not their real personality. Does that make sense? That makes complete sense. Yeah, and I think this is where the environment we're in plays a big role. So, you know, I'm not naturally a very organized person, but if I'm in a group and it seems to be lacking organization, I will probably, it's, it's part of subconscious, I'll come in and I'll start filling that role a l little bit more And it's completely not my natural mm. natural style. And so the situation, the group dynamics of a certain group means I start playing more of those those traits. So it's um it's not super clear cut. Yeah. But the tools are useful to start the conversation and the the kind of the type based tools are really useful for people that have not really considered the personality side very much. It's such a good introduction to people are different, people look at the world differently, we need to interact differently with each other and we need to consider the strengths everyone brings no matter what their kind of style so i do think there's a role for them in the team development process yeah, yeah. and maybe even to raise awareness that maybe someone is picking up a role that is not natural so maybe they cannot be their best selves that's right it starts it, these interesting conversations start emerging which is you know uh, often an interesting exercise with these is guess where your team members are and you know you might guess that ah oh, miriam sits over here and then you see miriam's results come back and go oh that's different let's actually that's worthwhile exploring a little bit and having a conversation about mm. um, why does that difference emerge how does what does Miriam feel about it and they're the interesting conversations and I think that's the type of conversations we need to be having more of and I think these tools if they're facilitated well they'll help these conversations happen and then it's less about the tool mm. and more about the conversation so let's double click on that one mm. <laughs> so <laughs> how can you um And I don't want to hijack the conversation into personality <laughs> tests. Um, but when you say if they are facilitated well, so what would be the big maybe red flags or the mistakes we can avoid if we're using these personality tests in a group facilitation process? Great question. So I think the the first big kind of, thing to avoid is really taking these things as gospel and saying whatever these results come out as is is fact i think that's a really good starting point so um, you know especially tools like mbti when you start digging digging a little bit deeper in the science there's not they're not super robust so if we kind of accept that go look this is not a super robust tool but it could start an interesting conversation and i think looking at it as okay this has come up it's brought some interesting things up but these things are not necessarily fact so we're just going to use it as a platform for conversation i think that's part one of facilitating it well and by extension of that part two is dig deeper and have the conversation so really just look at it the tool as a platform for a conversation around how the team works better together where the different strengths are where the points of friction are and 
I think where I see the tools not facilitated as well is that we don't we steer away from that because it's a little bit messy and it's a little mm. bit that's where sometimes you get the heated conversations but we kind of almost need to lean into that when we're facilitating these types of sessions and what I what I hear or the the danger I see or the skill is to take enough time for this conversation mm. to go deeper than just the surface and understand what it means and what it means for the team without going too deep so that it's kind of a group therapy session <laughs> <laughs> where everyone is exploring their own personalities and talks about their child, which certainly at some point has its place, but maybe not yeah. necessarily. Not necessarily. And I think this is, with any workshop, comes down to we're usually running workshops with certain parameters at play you know we certain sometimes have a certain amount of time so i think we've just got to think what's going to be the given the amount of time we've got for right now how can we best spend that spend that time together with the team to help the team grow and develop yeah which brings me back to an earlier the earlier question about the difference between coaching and team development team development and it seems like a fine nuance. So the way how I understand it, I would like to hear your opinion, is that team coaching is how are we working together as a team, given all the personalities. And a facilitated team process would be how do we as a team achieve a goal together? So it's more on the process. So, for, for, and I think I mentioned earlier, I don't get too caught up in the distinction between the two. For, and I might be just being naive. For me, it's not, personally, it's not super relevant splitting mm. the two things out. Like if I'm running a session, I'm sometimes using more coaching orientated skills. Sometimes, and we know that there's a big overlap between those facilitation yeah. skills and the coaching skills. Sometimes I'm facilitating more of a process um, so I don't, I, this is probably not going to help answer your question very much, but I don't, I don't really, I haven't really taken the time to separate the two out. And for me personally, I don't see the benefits in doing that, but I'd love to be challenged on my thinking. I might be being naive and... Um, to be honest, I love your pragmatism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I just copy your answer next you time I'm asked. <laughs> <laughs> and if someone comes up with a good reason to separate the two out, let me for sure let me know because I'm I'm willing to be challenged. That I might be brushing under the carpet something which I need to tackle, and the easy way of doing that is saying it doesn't matter, or there might be some merit in what I'm saying. So I don't know. I might yeah. be wrong. <laughs> and it, I think as long as we're we're serving the group and facilitating the conversation they need to have, whether it's to achieve an outcome or to work better together. And Maybe even if I matter. get pedantic, I kind of go, if you work better together, you're more likely to achieve the outcome. So I, yeah. 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 I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Whether it's worthwhile being pedantic about these things or not, I don't know. Yeah. I haven't really concerned myself too much with the differentiation. Yeah. So let's uh, go back. Okay. So oh, leaving the tension. Yeah, coming back. <laughs> um, you spoke about rhythm and rituals and you spoke about the team development project being a process so where where do games come into play because up to now everything sounds very serious we have conversations that we need to understand each other's personalities <laughs> well look, this is where the two words you've said combined together which are called serious games mm -hmm. so the games are more serious in nature they help teams have these conversations which are usually harder to have but what the games do and this is where i think the games bring in magic is they automatically add some level of fun and safety to the conversation so ordinarily if a leader just stands up and asks a question they're not used, usually asking these questions you sometimes will get a little bit of a, a wall and people won't mm. necessarily engage the magic is and I, it's how people's perception of games and the way game mechanics work is you put these conversations through um a gameplay process and all of a sudden people start opening up a lot more and they start sharing a lot more than they 
ordinarily would. And I think if the games are designed well, they will make the process inclusive, they'll make it fun, they'll make it engaging. And it's I, I consider it it's a bit like magic, you know, it's a ordinary conversations that might be very difficult to have. They're easier to have when we've got a game in front of us. And so if I understand correctly, especially your example, the team leader can stand up and ask a question, um, a quite personal question, mm. and then everyone is like, uh, wants to hide behind <laughs> below the, the table or go offline. And a game that could be just pulling a card yeah. with the same and weeding out the question that has been given by the game gods. Yes. Change the dynamic that suddenly team members would be more open to answer it. Completely. And especially if you wrap that question up in some gameplay process and mechanic. So what makes the difference and what's the process and mechanic behind it? Well, I think when, um, when we play games... We, not necessarily everyone's got a really like, not everyone loves board games, for example. So that's, you know, but people, when you think games, you're, uh, there's automatically your, you're all of a sudden, rem you almost remove yourself from, hey, I'm having this really so serious conversation to I'm just playing a game. And I think that mental shift helps people approach those conversations pretty, pretty differently. I think the other part is often team leaders that are running these kinds of sessions they don't know what questions to ask so all, all of a sudden this deck that magically asks good questions that you can ask the group um, that's really helpful as well it gets around kind of the bad questions the leading questions um, and then I think depending on the, the game that you're playing you know games will often have some kind of theme they'll have some kind of interactivity mechanisms and All of, these, all of these things, what they do is, that I guess it goes back to the original point, they help shift people's mindset to, I'm not having this really awkward question, a conversation, I'm just playing a game. and mm. Games are light, games are fun. And before you know it, you've played a game and you've had some meaningful conversations that you've probably been putting off as a team. And you mentioned a good question, and I forget that it's easier to provide a team leader with a bunch of pre, pre prepared yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something with pre prepared questions <laughs> uh, instead of coaching them how to ask a good question. Yeah. And if you're designing a question deck that it must be able to apply to any team lead because you don't know who's going to play your game. Yeah. So how do you make sure that it's a good question, independent of the context of the organization, the cultural context, who's pulling that card? Yeah, great What? question. I think one thing you do, you try and make them the questions fairly broad, so they'll apply to most teams. But I think with, with any game, you build in mechanisms to redraw cards. So uh, over time, I think what happens is team leaders play, they get better at playing the game, they get better at judging you know, what kind of questions are coming up, what questions right for the group which questions you can skip and then you can ask another question. But once people get even more comfortable, they'll start kind of adding maybe their own. They, they might read a question which is fairly generic or doesn't quite apply. And so this is what, what will happen if I'm running the game is if I get a sense this is not the perfect question, I'll just go, let's look at this question. Let, let's use it as a bit of a, a prompt instead of looking at it really literally. So you just mm -hmm. adapt it. So if you look at the card as just a bit of inspiration, And you can just, as a facilitator, you can tweak it and go, where it says this, in our context, probably let's focus a little bit on this instead. But the, the card's done a lot of the work to get you thinking of the things that you should be asking. And this is now getting in an interesting um, direction because you, this is where facilitation comes in. Mm. So if I understand correctly, it's not a game that the team can just play amongst them but it needs a facilitator does a facilitator need to be external so this is a really good so these are questions actually i'm toying around now because the games uh, that i'm building at the moment they're almost they have a role of host but the host can also play so the game actually takes you through the process now what i've come to realize in kind of observing these sessions is someone who is more skilled at being a host or facilitator 
they won't just whiz through the game. They'll notice interesting things, patterns and trends that are coming. And uh, to you, you know, steal your phrase, they'll double click on them. Uh, whereas I think if you took it literally, let's say you didn't have a facilitator, you could still have a good quality conversation. It just won't be as good as if there's someone that is playing that host role. Now that host doesn't need to be external, but there is a beauty in sometimes having conversations facilitated for, by an external because they may go somewhere where a team leader might not go. They may see trends that the team leader might not see. And the team leader sometimes needs to be a part of the conversation and process. And it's very hard to wear the hat of facilitation and being in the conversation mm. at the same time. And I can imagine that there are some questions that appear very naive But in the context of a team, suddenly they are very loaded. Mm. And where a team leader might, or someone who's involved might avoid that, an external neutral facilitator might just lean mm. into it and maybe provoke the, the conversations that the team actually needs. Absolutely. Yeah, so even if you like a simple question like, you know, what, what's something you feel like the team has done well recently? You know, it seems like a nice question, pretty soft. And you might read the answers. They might all seem fine. And the facilitator might then read the answers and go, these are actually pretty, I can notice a pattern here. They're all really surface level things. This is telling me something. So you might not tackle that thing immediately. You mm -hmm. might say, let's come, what, see what comes up in some of the other conversations. And you might notice that actually everything's really at the surface level. The team isn't processing things or talking about things at a deeper level. So that then you might bring that up. Um, and I think these are all the wonderful things that facilitators do when they run these types of sessions. So would then be, and maybe this uh, also includes then the, what you mentioned as rhythms and rituals, is the entire process then facilitated or is this kind of, how can you enable the team to create this rhythm and ritual so that they are not becoming dependent yeah. on the facilitator. Absolutely. And I think self-sufficiency is a really, if we want these things to happen more regularly, we need to equip the team with the skills to do these things. And that's where I hope the games do this. I think uh, my, my philosophy is, let's say a team plays the game and they have a really good conversation. Let's say it's 80% of the way there. And a facilitator might be able to take it to a 100%. So you've got a little bit of a, a, a drop-off. But having an 80% conversation is better than having a zero <laughs> conversation. So actually... Even if it's not quite perfect, the fact that they're doing it, they're playing the games, they're having these conversations, and let's say they're building other, other rhythms and rituals where they're having these types of conversations. Even if it's not perfect, it's better than not having these conversations at all. And then I think you do, like, there might be certain conversations or points in time where you bring in someone external. And external doesn't mean they have to be, you know, external to organization. You can just go to another mm -hmm. team and go, hey, team leader from the other team, You know, can you just come in and run something for us? We've we've seen you run sessions before. You're you're really good at facilitating things. Do you mind coming in and spending an hour with the team just to do something independently and having independent eyes? So I think external doesn't need to mean external to the organization. Yeah. Yeah. And this has even more advantages because it builds bridges between teams. They learn about maybe different units, make new connections, build trust. Oh, absolutely. And look, I think I'm a really big fan. Once you start getting, let's say you've got your own team rhythm and ritual going well, start building rhythms and rituals with other teams. Because mm. I think that there's so much power in the cross-functional bringing yeah. teams together for many, many reasons. Like I think, you know, breaking down silos, fresh ideas, fresh perspectives. I think there's just so many benefits to the cross-functional aspect. Yeah. So what do you mean exactly by rhythms and rituals? So my take, rhythms and rituals... Again, I, like, I, I try and keep these things relatively simple. I think it's things the team is doing regularly, almost like clockwork. So you can almost say, look, the beginning of every quarter, we're going to get together as a team and we're going to set our goals for the, the quarter. And at the midpoint of the quarter, we're going to have another thing where we're going to check in on the goals. And at the end of the quarter, we're going to do a reflection on how we went and set mm. our next goals. And you could almost set your watch, your calendar by that. And I think it's, I try to look at it to go try and, build rhythms and rituals so that example i'd say is around goals so r rhythms and rituals around clarity try and build rhythms and rituals that are about connection 
try and bring build rhythms and rituals which are around collaboration and try and build rhythms and rituals which are around celebration. Mm. I think that they're really four good areas to if you're like a team and go, oh, I want to do some more of these things. Look at those four areas and go, how can I, you know, over the course of a quarter, three months, how can we have a good rhythm which addresses each of those different areas? Nice. Thank I'm glad I asked the question. Yeah. <laughs> And would you then, for each of the four areas, are there specific games that you would play to facilitate that? But I Yeah, I do. There's definitely games I'll lean on for those four areas. But it's not just limited to those games, but there's certainly games that are connected to each of those. So there, it's a different type of game you would use for goal setting, for connection, for celebration. Which was the fourth one? collaboration collaboration yeah yeah there's a different game for each of those areas so what makes the diff how do you choose what kind of game to use for what kind of challenge or ritual or yeah topic so i think um part of it is looking at the team and kind of going what does the team need right now so if we're if we're kind of just doing a one-off or like let's say it's just you know, we're coming in and we're like okay let's we, the team seems to be on the wrong path they need to be on the right path i think it's just doing a little bit of deep diving and digging and, and you know talking to the team um sometimes you can go back to things that, that already exist like um, culture surveys and just having a look at those areas and saying what what does the team seem to be missing now um a bit of work that i did last year with some organizations was helping them build a diagnostic so you run a diagnostic with the team first that tells you the areas where the team feels they're doing well and not so well and then you decide what interventions you um you put in place from there so so a diagnostic would be an area that you would not gamify it has not, oh. been, not, not gamified yet but th i think this is uh <laughs> could be for the future like you could def i could definitely see how there could be a diagnostic based uh game that you play where the team kind of evaluates what they're doing well and what they're doing less well it's not a, not a game i've developed as of yet but it's I think with any of these things, there's ways to ways to gamify them. Um, so, makes, what makes a game? I can I can imagine. Okay, you, you pick a card and you read out a card. Maybe it's already a game. Then, does a game need to have a winner and a loser, or a board, or a clear well a set of rules? I guess. Yeah. Great question. Look, I I think from my perspective with the game, you've got. Some of the things you've spoken about there, games will have usually components. So if it's a game, so we look at a game, you can't just have a game that's just a deck of cards. You know, there's plenty of games that are just classic 52, um, 52 cards, and you can. There's millions of games you can play. Um, so you've got the game components. I think that's a an important part. Um, mechanics is another piece. So what's the what are some of the rules? And I like to look at these things in terms of the gameplay loop. So I think what's the what's the loop here that someone's going to repeat over the course of a game? And sometimes that loop can be really short and sometimes that can be a slightly longer loop. Uh, but what's the core loop that they're going to be undertaking in the game? And loop means everyone, every player of the game does the same thing. Exactly, multiple times. Okay. And usually the loop will be they'll do something, there'll be an action and based on that action there'll be a some form of feedback so there'll be like a feedback mm -hmm. loop in there as well and that should dictate something that happens in the game and so you get into that loop of i do something i get some feedback something happens in the game i do something i get some feedback something happens in the game um and so i think games should they don't have to but i think they should have a nice gameplay loop because that's what makes the game fun if that core gameplay loop is fun you'll keep coming back to playing that that game mm. And what makes it fun? Is it are these brain chemicals? So you're poking dopamine yeah. <laughs> or serotonin or one of those? Oh, how do you make it fun? So I think fun is one of those funny ones, funny ones, because um, everyone has a different idea of what is fun for them. Um, I think the core things that go into something being fun it it creates some level of engagement and flow. So you play the you do the thing. And it makes you lose track of time. You know, for me, that's an important part of fun. It's an engaging, mm. mindful experience. So it doesn't matter if you find, you know, cooking fun, knitting fun, um, whatever your 
view as fun is normally it's fun because you get immersed into the activity and it creates kind of a sense of sense of flow mm -hmm. for you i think some of the other things that help create fun are things like variety and novelty so i think not knowing what's coming up there being a sense of variety i think that helps create fun i think other mechanics that help create fun although i think we've got to be careful in a business context how much we lean on these mechanics are things like competition mm. um, it can engage us and can make things uh things enjoyable and fun for us i do think sometimes fun can be things that make us laugh as well so i think there's a bit of a com combination i don't think there's like a you have to check every one of those boxes i certainly think you've got to check the engagement and flow box for it to be a fun experience but whether it's makes you laugh out loud or whether it really immerses you Mm -hmm. They can both be different types of different types of fun that you lean into. Can it be too much fun? That it because we're sp still speaking of a professional context of yeah. serious games of team development. If it's too much fun, that is there always development for fun? Well, I'd say the fun is only a problem in a business context if it really starts detracting from the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. And I think this is where sometimes the light-hearted interventions we might do might make everyone laugh they might be really engaging but they don't build towards any ongoing out outcomes so I'd, i'd say then in that situation there's too much of the wrong kind of fun mm. I, I, i hate saying the word wrong because it's not it's not as prescriptive as that but it's not necessarily fun that's serving then the team to grow and develop but let's say you're coming to work and everyone comes to work every day They have an absolute blast because they get along so super well with everyone. They love the mechanics of how the team works. Everyone is doing super meaningful work. They love it. They're so immersed in it that they could literally, if you didn't tell them, hey, go home, they'll be there doing their thing. Is that a bad thing? If everyone's doing that every day? I, don't, I personally don't think that's a... If you ask the families at home, maybe. Maybe they're... <laughs> that's right. There's probably the, the whole balance side yeah. of the equation yeah. but if people are coming in and they're really enjoying being at at work because they find it fun yeah i don't think that's too much too much fun i think it's it's only when it starts really detracting from what you know yeah. what teams should be focusing on and what i hear is if it's basically the this feedback loop is missing mm. so if the fun bit what the team is doing does not inform the next loop or the next stop step. Yeah. I think if there's a lack of the, the loop, the lack of that kind of growth loop. And again, I don't want to, I, I think there is a time and space for some of the lighthearted, you know, let off some steam, just get together and have some fun that doesn't necessarily have this objective at the end of it. I think the problem is when that's the only thing or that's mm. the predominant thing that teams do to build their team chemistry connection, that's problematic because it doesn't, yeah meet that objective yeah yeah and i guess that um and that might be where the bad um the bad connotation comes from mm. is that at the end it feels like maybe a waste of time because yes we had fun but usually i don't go to work to have fun because of my own friends yeah. <laughs> right? well, this is yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's not often for most people it's not the primary yeah. although I, th i you know i would uh, if you're in a position where you do have the luxury to kind of choose where you're working i would say that should go up in the priority yeah. list like i think we yes. spend so much time at work and if you're at a place which makes you miserable and you're in the position where you are you do have the luxury to choose where you work definitely question if you're in a place that makes you miserable yes to amplify yeah. the fun yeah. you have um true and um yeah i have to contradict myself now i um i recently had a a call with someone I'm mentoring. So um, he's now at the end of his master's degree and was wondering, oh, shall I go in this direction or shall I go? It was basically sustainable startup or big corporate insurance. Yeah. And then I asked him, where are you more likely to find colleagues whose company you really enjoy? Yeah. Because I think we're spending so much time at work. So... Um, Am I the person who actually enjoys hanging out with people who are working in a corporate insurance, <laughs> or am I more? Is it gonna be? Or is it more gonna be the, the, the yeah, the startup vibe, sustainability, the activists? Yeah. Um. So yeah, actually, you're right. Although I should one massive caveat. So actually, lots of the things we're talking about here, 
is that one of my strongest values is also fun. So I'm coming at this very biased because I will probably optimize most decisions for what's the most fun thing to do here. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm super biased with this. And people will have different values and some people don't value fun, which is fine. They've got different values. And I think part of an individual's decision-making process should be guided towards what's going to close the gap between where I am now and what I value and kind of get that cl gap uh, closer. And if you don't value fun, then don't prioritise that <laughs> as a decision-making metric. Makes Even sense. though I believe everyone can, should be having fun all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe the, maybe the word fun is too extreme for some. Mm. But I think um, some joy, some levels of joy. Yeah, enjoyment. Yes. Yeah. And thank you for mentioning the word values. Yeah. So... There's a value game. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so where do team values come in and how important is it actually to align on values or maybe to even choose team members based on shared values? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting interesting angle. And actually, you know, it, it was funny when I started. The first game I developed was focused on individual values and basically the pur purpose of the game is you play with a partner and you build a values profile about each other so you know if we play together by the end of the game i'd have a map about what are the things that i believe miriam values based on some of the things she's shared with me um and always the conversation would then come up is well how does this fit in with organizational values so i think mm. it's a, a really um important connection to make and i i i personally look at it as a, if you've got a set of organizational bu business values one of the primary purposes of that is to help guide the business decisions that you make and talk a little bit about the type of culture that you want to want to create. However, we've got to be really careful about how we use those values then in the selection process so that we're not just creating a lack of cognitive diversity. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really careful, it, it's a really tricky, it's a, not super linear the way to approach this, but you want to balance out both what, do we need from an organizational level what kind of culture do we want to create and how do we want to make decisions around here versus also we want to foster individual diversity and have individuals that have different values um, so it's a tricky line to to walk i think you've just got to be really mindful of we're not just hiring a clone clone after clone mm. after clone because we'll just then get a high level we'll just basically have a bunch of homogenous teams who eventually will stop innovating and helping the company grow and develop where I then land on is basically I think what you want to try and avoid is getting in people that are really, that there's no overlap at all between your business values and the individual values. Mm -hmm. And you want to avoid getting in people that are really clashing a lot with the values that you've set out. I don't think you necessarily just need these overlap and clones yeah. to create a successful business. Instead, I think, coming back to your example, if one of the company values is fun, mm and someone comes in who doesn't value fun as an important value. Yeah. Might be difficult to get along. On the other hand, when I think of large corporates, they often have these values that don't mean anything. No. Oh, we our values are trust, transparency <laughs> and collaboration. <laughs> and when you look around you, it's like is that really? That doesn't look like what we... <laughs> and then I think it might be difficult to have this type of conversation with the team to align to the company values when then actually the conclusion is, well, the company values don't mean anything. No. So how do we deal with it as a team? And I think even the reality is, like the actual reality when you go out is you have business values and different teams will adopt slightly different values. This just happens. It's just different teams will start valuing different things at a team level. So I think that's just the reality of the way it happens. You can't create these carbon copies, I think. So if we mm. just look at the values as a, this guides us at a business level. That's the main thing this does. And teams then maybe are not a carbon copy of those values. But again, as long as they're kind of adopting maybe some, adding some new ones to the mix, and mm. it's not contradictory to what we're doing at the business level, so I generally say alignment and being directionally correct across the business is really important, but you're not looking to create mm. lots of clones. Yeah, um, and everyone brings their own stories, narratives of how they live and experience the values anyway. Absolutely. And actually those conversations are really 
great conversations to be having. So what does this value mean to you? What does this mean to us as a team? Who has lived these values? Because I think they're important things to recognize. But I think when we're being realistic, it's these things play out in quite, quite different ways. And um, inevitably, you'll get little subcultures and microcultures within teams across a business. That, that's going to, you can't stop that from happening. Where would you see the difference between microcultures and silos? So, f good question. I think for me, the silos I would see as being detrimental to the organizational performance. So, generally speaking, silos will be teams operating independently from one another. They won't be sharing information. They'll be blaming another team for something going wrong. All of that is friction, and that then slows slows a business down. Whereas I think microculture is just accepting that different teams might have a slightly different way of working. They might mm. have a slightly different culture. Ultimately, they're all going to be under, under the banner of the business. They so hope there's some general alignment, um, but there, there's going to be differences across teams, but it's not at the detriment of the business. It's actually helping the business perform better. Makes sense. And I'm just thinking of sports and teams. So... You're originally from the UK, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I think of uh, of um, British soccer, yes, there's a lot of competition and there's a lot of rivalry. Yeah. So to what extent do you think that it's possible to to overdo this team culture generation or development? So we're developing such a strong commitment or such a strong bonding within a team that they could become rivals yeah. to other teams is this is this realistic or is it not so i think in the sporting context it happens because almost each sport team is a different business mm -hmm. so whereas i think in the organizational context all the teams are connected by the unified business goals purpose vision mm. so optimally you know optimally Everyone should be working. And this is why I said earlier that the directional alignment is really important. Everyone should be, well, all the teams should be working to make sure that as a business we, we succeed and perform. I think that's where the sports one with the different teams, the rivalry, rivalries essentially are between different businesses. Uh, and then only if they're coming together, for instance, in the European context, then suddenly the same nation... Yes, teams, the players from different teams come together. And then they become friends or they're... Yeah. yeah, fighting for the same goal. That's right. They come together under the national banner. Yeah. And all of a sudden, that national banner overrides any rivalries they might have at the club level. Although, again, the reality is you see this a lot. They come together at the club level. There's clicks because the clicks are if I play with you on my local club team, then we're going to get along better. I might not like you so much because we had a game against you a few weeks ago and that didn't go so well. So, the reality is the coach of that national team then probably has to do a work on making sure that national team has a good t team development process that even though your day job means you're working against each other when you come together as the national team we're as one one unit and a good coach should work on those relationships interesting yeah i can see um actually lots of lots of commonalities or learnings for uh, for team cultures in the business context from sports yeah in order to just because I think the distinction that if you're working together in a team, you don't have to be best friends. No. So how can you get along and respect each other? Although maybe in your private life you would not share beer. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that is the where we go back to just understanding that people are are different. And just because we're into different things and we wouldn't hang out outside of work doesn't mean I can't empathize and understand your different perspective and the value you bring to the team and to our team performing. Yeah. Can you think of a negative outcome? So what would be the, of playing a game with a team? So you come in with best intentions. Yeah. You're a newly, air quotes, graduated facilitator. <laughs> yes, I want to use games yeah. for team development. And then everything goes wrong and the team starts to really fight and to be in a worse place. Is this possible? And how could this, how can someone mess it up? Yeah, look, 
And I think this can happen with any team intervention, games included, is it starts bringing up things that the team has never tackled. So you see this with any type of intervention. The game starts asking questions. It, it basically is the game, you know, pokes. game it po- it's poking the team. Poking, it's poking, it's poking. And if it pokes too much and you're not used to being poked and you don't want to, you know, for whatever reason, talk about these things, or you haven't spoken about these things, then it can, you know, emotions can blow up and people can, you know, react poorly within the team team context. So I think that's a... I imagine anyone that's facilitated stuff before that's in this space, they will have experienced this dynamic happen where in that moment, for whatever reason, it's gone... And that happens in game. It can happen in the games as well. Um, often with the games, there's... You can almost... The ones we've developed, you can almost put them on a spectrum of some which are super light. It's very unlikely that... I'd almost say very, very unlikely they're going to result in any... Um, of those explosion moments and there's some which poke a little bit more which are more likely to so i'd often say look if you start like you've never done these things before start up with some of those ones which are focused on connection or celebration mm. it's very rare connection conversations r- result in an outcome which will become overly emotionally charged and very unlikely those strengths style celebrating strengths and what people do well very unlikely they result in those emotionally charged conversations uh, they're pretty safe places to start and then those about alignment mm. and collaboration they are more likely to explode they're more likely to although I, th- I think this is where the games do help in that they provide it just makes it a little bit less light and a little bit less full-on so even though the poking's happening it's under the guise of a game so that it i, I feel like the games help make those conversations easier um, can you give an example Yeah, of one of those kind of poking type yeah. moments. I, it could be, you know, a, co- a co- question such as, what do you feel like the team hasn't done so well recently? You know, that 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 can open up a whole bunch of... Finger pointing. It can. Yeah. Yeah, it can definitely open up a bunch of finger pointing. Um, How would you react to that? So would you then keep it at the team level, not be getting personal? Or do you think it's it's important to actually voice that. And if it is personal, let's make it personal. Yeah, I think it's a really, you know, and this again, this is where it's useful having a facilitator coming because a facilitator can judge, is the group ready to have a more honest conversation or not? And if a team has done no work in this space before, they're probably not ready then to start having this super charged conversation that may involve pointing fingers, may involve unpacking some of that work. So you may want to kind of build the team's, I think, capacity to have some of those conversations a little bit more before you kind of jump into that, potentially. Um, I think once a team, and this is why I find it's beneficial having that regular routine and rhythm, because A, you're more likely to be having the conversation before the issue blows up. And and B, if you're playing and having these conversations regularly, you're starting to build the muscles and skills to have these conversations better. Mm. Um, One case comes to my mind that probably everyone came across. You have a team and there's this one person. And the entire team agrees that this one person is a problem yeah. for whatever reason. Either because they're never doing their job or they're leaving too early. How do you how would you face this situation? What is the best approach? Yeah. And I think there's some conversations that A conversation like that is not really a team level conversation. It's an, an individual is maybe there's a performance issue there. So I think that's where the ideally the team leader is having that conversation with the individual. One on one. And I, hopefully they haven't waited a long, long time to have this conversation because if they have, then it's become a really big thing. Mm. Um, and like with those team conversations, I always say with a, I talk about a coaching rhythm as well as leaders need to have that rhythm with one on one with every person they, they lead. So ideally as a team, we're getting together and we're talking about all these things about our team functioning but then a leader should be talking very regularly with each of their team members as well around how are you going how are we going and how can that that relationship be be better and those are the times when you want to be having some of those conversations about look Miriam your works you know I feel like the work has been coming in late quite a lot recently Um, you know that causes significant impact on the team but that's just my take that's what I'm seeing can you explain to me how it looks from your perspective mm. you open up and you have a conversation curiosity well yeah <laughs> instead <laughs> of know. judgment yeah instead of judgment instead of going this is wrong because you don't know why you know and that if that individual then gets a chance to say look 
you've got some points. Maybe I have been late, but this is some of the other stuff that's been happening. And you then have a conversation about it yeah. rather than pointing fingers. Yeah. Are there aspects, because I'm now thinking of this conversa one-on-one -on -one conversation, coaching mm -hmm. conversation, or regular check-in between the team leader and their, their teammates. Are there things that you, where you say, okay, there is no game needed or you can overdo the game thing? If every team interaction, every interaction between two individuals, <laughs> there's, there's, a always, game. there's always a game. <laughs> And look, I think the <laughs> yeah, answered my own question. <laughs> I know I should just say actually just play games for everything. There's a game for, it. but no. Look, I think um, as I mentioned with a good game, a lot of well, fun when we talk about fun, variety is part of fun. I think we don't we that applies to conversations. You know, some conversations we can definitely leave <laughs> organic. We don't need to bring the game in, um, and other conversations is going to help the help the process. So I think. Ultimately, it's coming back to, you know, what's the what's the objective? What are we trying to achieve here? And what's going to help us get there? I find the games work really well um, at creating a safe environment to have more challenging conversations that make them a little bit more fun and engaging. Um, but sometimes maybe that's not, you know, even playing a game might not be appropriate. Let's say it's a serious conflict that the team's experiencing. You probably don't want to be going down the game. It just probably doesn't match the context of what the team's going through. Mm. And so it's... It, That mismatch is not going to go down well. Uh, hey, I bought a game. I bought a game. Exactly. <laughs> let's have fun. Big smile. Let's have fun. And feel very could feel very dismissive. It could actually, feel very yeah. dismissive, and yeah. it's not going to be matched. So I think you're, we're always what we're doing is just trying to match, read the room, match what's the best intervention for where the team yeah. is at at the moment. Um, and the path I've gone down is just build a bunch of versatile games which you could use in lots of situations, but not it's not going to be every situation. Um, and what I hear is the. The complexity, actually, in choosing the game and using the game without having the necessary coaching skills mm. or facilitation skills. And I, <laughs> the image that comes to my mind is when you're buying a drug, you usually have the little paper that, um, <laughs> please consult your pharmacist before and well, the don't effects. use the side effects and yeah. don't use it <laughs> under these circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> Would you add something like that to your <laughs> games? <laughs> I, look, and I think these are really, like, um, part of the process I'm going through now is even thinking about, okay, what are all the different use cases? So, like, what, it's almost like if you're in this situation, this is probably a good game to play. If it's this, maybe here's some certain pathways. Here's how you can maybe build some rhythms and rituals around the games. Um, so there's that part, trying to give a bit more guidance. So, you know, yes, use your judgment, but here's some help for you. I think the other part then is what you're describing here is almost like what are some of the things you should watch out for that are maybe a bit of a flag to go, hey, either this types of thing is you see these things emerging, maybe stop playing the game and start hang having a different kind of conversation or maybe stop the game and let's say you're a team leader, maybe then bring in someone from the people and culture team, HR mm -hmm. team, learning and development team, whatever it might be to help you out. But I think it's useful then if you're a team leader or a host to understand where your limits are so you don't jump in and then you you as a leader feel like you're out of your depth because that's not a good feeling for a leader yeah. to, to have um, i'm just thinking of the okay in one out of ten thousand teams this could happen yeah. <laughs> in ten out of ten thousand yeah. teams <laughs> this could happen right? and then i mean i'm laughing and joking but on the more serious side it can also create this um recognition that it's okay it does happen and yeah. it has nothing to do with you as a team leader no yeah sometimes Or it might be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> true yes no it is i think yeah and, and i think this is part of the it's looking at w w with a product like this is like i When you're coming to facilitate something, you've got a higher de degree of control. You know who's going to be in the room, room how you're going to facilitate something. And yet as facilitators, when we adapt as well, if we go in, it's for some reason things are different. We've got all this experience to draw upon. Sometimes a leader might not have have these things. So I think it's trying to des – how do we design – A, design the game in a way so it kind of guides them through the process – um, and then what are all the supporting things we need to build around the games to really help? Mm. And then I think what you're touching, which I think is a great ad addition to this, is 
what are some of the things to look out for, signs, symptoms that it's not quite going to plan, that you're suffering one of the ill side effects. Um, and you might just need to pause and do something a little bit different. And um, we spoke so much about games. Yeah. And one of the things, I think there's a couple of points, you questions you asked, and just to give you a rapid fire answer on a couple of those things. You mentioned that they need to be competitive or mm -hmm. cooperative. Um, I think people have the perception they have to be competitive. They don't. So that's one. I think they can be a blend of the two. They can be completely cooperative. They can be completely competitive. Um, and I think there was another question which I wanted to close the loop on. Ah, I think whether it needs a winner. I think mm. it needs an outcome. So I think it needs an end point. So I often say you have your... In you explain the introductions, you go through all these gameplay loops and there should be a nice end closure mm. as well. That, so sorry, I just wanted to kind of wrap those... Uh, and that's... Um that's a good one because now I also understand why just having question cards is not a game because there's no loop and there's no endpoint. Yeah. So can you give an example of a game that you designed? Yeah. I'll use the one which is the most popular. I think I spoke about it on the little last one. Does it the matter? The Quinks. Yes. yes. Should I speak about a different one? Or yes, should please. I yes. Um, I'll talk about the one to do with values i think that's a good business values mm -hmm. so i think this is a um, a good flip to quinks being the individual individual values so the the team values game is um everyone comes in to a session they and it's played as a team ideally and the whole game is designed around talking about the business or team values more and so basically there's the gameplay loop essentially is there's four different types of questions you pick you basically roll the version of a dice, the game's version of a dice. It tells you which color of the question to pick up. You pick up that question. There's a few... I don't know if you've ever played the game Cranium before. Mm -mm. But um, So when you play Cranium, each card has a different style of question on it. And so you pick up the card. And depending on the style of question, either everyone in the group will have to answer or certain people from the group will okay. have to answer. And then there's a round of voting. So I don't know if you've played Cards Against Humanity, but there's usually mm -hmm. voting on which answer people like the best. Mm -hmm. That's built into the game. And then based on the amount of votes you get, you move around the board. And that's literally the loop. So you just play that mm -hmm. type of card, answer the question, vote, move around. And do you give guidelines on how to vote? Because what you don't want is that someone turns into a people pleaser to give an answer. Or maybe that's built into the game. Or what... To what extent is it important to be authentic? Well, so I, I find it's funny how people... I, I generally find people will just answer... Because when you're playing... There's a certain degree of time pressure. You're kind of almost... You're not completely put on the spot and you can think about what you've got to say, but not so much that you completely massage your mm. answer to the question. And I think you see this happen in Cards Against Humanity as well, where people just start bringing the natural, like, natural sense of humour to the table because whilst it's got competition, it's super light. Can you explain um, if someone is not familiar uh, yes. with the cards, cards against... Well, okay. <laughs> it's a very uh, politically incorrect game, but um, that doesn't matter. It's more about... I mean, the, the name says it all, well, right? It, does. <laughs> yeah, it should give the clue. <laughs> uh, someone will flip over a, uh, a card and the card will have a blank space in it. So it might say whatever. Um, I'm trying to think of an example that's not... <laughs> That's more politically correct. Uh, I can't think of what I've played completely. Uh, it can be very politically un <laughs> incorrect. It might say something like Viren like I won't say my name, but um, it might say Donald Trump likes eating X, and it will leave a blank spot. And everyone else has got these cards, and they've got to pick what they're going to put forward as their blank spot answer. So they fill in the blank using their range of cards that they've got. And the range of cards has different words. It has different words on it. Yeah. <laughs> And the w <laughs> and the words are all politically <laughs> incorrect words. So what you're going to end up with some very funny statements. Everyone puts forward their card, and the person that is um, choosing the winner for that round will read out all the cards people have put forward. And usually they'll say, "Donald Trump loves eating," and they'll read out all the blanks. Children. There. Yeah, someone might put children. <laughs> <laughs> or pizza. <That's> good. <laughs> or pizza, which. <laughs> and. The person chooses the answer they like best. In answering that question, though, people aren't... They're, honestly, the winning is very, very incidental. <laughs> and so people aren't really, like, really G'd up to try and win. If they win, they give a little cheer. It's fun. Mm -hmm. The person picked their answer. 
But ultimately, they've forgotten about it because they're on to the next card straight after. And honestly, that's almost exactly the same mechanic here. It's like you might get chosen as the best answer. Yes, you're moving around the board furthest. But when most people play, the competition is just a very... It's just to make it a bit more engaging. Mm. It's rarely at the detriment of um, good quality conversation. Of course, as with any team, the honesty and the quality of answer you're going to get depends on how mature the team is. Mm. And I think when you start out and it's the first time playing, the answers are going to stay fairly surface but if you play the game once a month the answers get better and better because mm. the team gets more comfortable when they see oh, i gave the answer last time i didn't get sacked for my job my team leader didn't have a go at me for saying that i could probably push the boundaries a little bit more next time around but it takes time you can't go from not having these conversations at all to getting super yeah. deep and meaningful overnight the regularity and that's why the rhythms and rituals are important yeah how much time do you think a team leader could make for playing games to bring for these four areas so i think if we say games and other interventions so if we say how much time should a team leader be spending on you know how the team works together their team development i would i would say if you kind of look at all the rituals and things like that you're probably looking at a couple of hours a week if or more depending on how interdependent the team is with one another so i think there's some context there mm. is if the team If ultimately the performance of your team is really dependent on how well the team works together, you probably want to be looking at having those conversations more. If it's less dependent on that, then you can get away with probably having less. I'd say two hours is probably a good rule of rule of thumb. Um, a lot of the teams I work with, they'll often have a hour team meeting that they're having anyway. And it's like, well, let's look at how you do that and make it better if you're doing that regularly. And then maybe sprinkle in something else to the mix so let's say two hours is not a bad starting point which you go up and down based on yeah makes sense had a question in mind and now I forgot it poof <laughs> what's your number one facilitation challenge Ooh, my number one facilitation challenge. And this is parking the games aside for now. Is it just like looking at facilitation and... I would say... My, my, so there's, I'll give two answers here because I think um, one's probably a surface e answer, but it is a challenge, which is I'm not super good at keeping time. So that would be like a very tactical challenge I have is... I like look, approaching these things pretty fluidly. I'll go in and let's just see what t seems to be attracting the attention of the group and let's talk about that, unpack that for as long as we need. But sometimes that is the detriment of getting, especially let's say you've got two hours, I've let the conversation go too long and there's other things maybe we need to kind of cover off and touch on and don't get that really nice close that would be useful to have if I'd manage the time a little bit better. So I'd say that's probably... Um, probably the biggest tactical challenge. I think the biggest non-tactical challenge would be... I think, especially if there's a clear-cut decision needed by the end, I think just getting where... Because I'm a big fan of bringing those different opinions, different ideas. But then that piece of, you know, how do we get that right decision made at the end across the group that can i think be pretty pretty mm. challenging if you've opened up lots of doors yeah and lots of ideas and lots of perspectives and then kind of taking that and getting a resolution by the end there might be two actually they might be related you know it might be my time <laughs> I was just not thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not allowing enough time for that process to happen properly so i think probably spending too much time in the divergent space and not enough in the convergent space is mm. probably a broader challenge that I'm kind of working on as a facilitator. And it could almost, it almost sounds like a catch-22 because if you're not allowing enough time in the convergence, then, and you're trying to bring everyone back and now it's time to take a decision, yeah. then everyone feels rushed and stressed and you might lose actually the, the right moment and then you don't have the team behind the decision that they're making. That's right. Or even like a danger is you just don't get there at all and like let's just deal with this afterwards and it becomes a after the workshop yeah. 
problem. And yeah, is that that's got issues as well because then people go away and it's like yeah, as you say, you haven't got the group right completely there by yeah. the end of the session. And I even wonder. I had this conversation recently with someone. I don't remember with whom. That now that we're working in this hybrid world, anyway, anyway, and by hybrid I don't mean that some team members are remote and others are in the same room, but hybrid in a sense that some parts of the work are doing remotely and some parts of the work are doing um, been done together. It's so much easier to detach the final decision making from the actual work because. When I think especially of these full day or multiple day team workshops, when it comes to the end where suddenly it's the decision making moment, yeah. everyone is so exhausted and just wants to go to the bar or go home or whatever. Very few people actually have the headspace and the emotional energy to take that decision. Oh. They just want it to be over. Yeah. So and then the next day they wake up and like What did we decide? Can we revert that? And so they do, or they are, or they are just so many um, endorphins or hormones in the space because it is exciting yeah. that people tend to be overconfident anyway. Yes. So is it the best time, you know, to be making decisions right at the end of a day or something anyway? Um, And I'd say probably not. So I think wh why not lean into that though and then design the process better so it's like you make it clear up front that we're, this is just going to be about uh, diverging and we'll converge afterwards or after the fact. Or I think, yeah, rather than trying to build everything into the single single session. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there might be a danger there that um, well, if it's planned ahead, mm. I don't even think so. No, if And it's planned ahead, yeah. yeah. Unless that um, the day after there are actually more questions than answers, and you realize yeah. how complex it actually is, yeah. but even then, I think it's it's better to have this opportunity than to have a fal false positive. But this is true. It's better to have the conversation. Actually, is this whilst again it feels like painful in the moment because you're revit like opening something, but it's like actually making sure we're going in the right direction before we commit to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so almost delaying by on purpose. On purpose. Yeah. Whereas I think, you know, if I look at my personal challenge, it's probably not happening as much on purpose mm -hmm. as as um, as it potentially should. So I think it's the... Uh, so maybe you can turn your, your challenge into uh, your signature move. Well, there you go. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it's intentional then. It's like, yes. okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because maybe there's something to it. I think, yeah, letting people sit on it, sleep on it before making a decision. Um, and if I look at, you know, just slight deviating back to the game, the way the game ends is it gets people to kind of think about the gameplay experience and reflect on that. And even in that, I'm actually, I, I recommend delayed action then. It's not, you're not, tr the purpose of the rhythms and rituals isn't to come up with the answer. It's to have the conversations and then you figure out what to prioritize later. So I'm already doing that with the games. Mm -hmm. Maybe doing that with other workshops is a good idea too. So does it mean that you do or you don't put it on a meta level after each immediately after each game? So okay, let's look at how this worked on on a meta level. Yes, yeah, so after each game, then the team leader host gets a report of everyone's reflections on the game. Because mm. um, I, I what I observe leaders sometimes try and do is they try and capture every detail of everything everyone's saying. And I'm like, don't worry about that. Trust the process and go look, have the conversations. Unless, of course, you notice something that's coming up time and time again, make a note of it. But just go th have the conversations, let people talk, and then trust that the end of the process when people kind of, it all melt, melds together, that's when you're going to get the best insights. It's not in the detail. It will, mm. it will all surface at the end. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is a, a beautiful, challenging moment for the team leader to just lean back to be fully present because I think it's also has something might have something to do with control being and remaining in control I'm taking notes yeah. I, I know what's happening instead of being present what's happening 
and then trusting that afterwards the overall impression will be strong, will be strong. enough. Yeah. yeah, and the best things will surface to the yeah. top. Um, yeah. And it's, you see this a lot when like uh, teams that have not done a lot of stuff like this and they start doing, like let's say, ideation stuff and when they learn useful ideation techniques, all of a sudden there's tons of ideas. And you see leaders at mm-hmm. this moments really, you go, oh, how, how are we going to do all these things? <laughs> Don't worry about doing all of them. You're not yeah. doing all of them. You're yeah. just the best stuff will surface to the top and trust the process that yeah. it will. But you do see this moment of panic and I think it is lost control. Ah, all of a sudden we've got to do all these ideas um, or we've got to do all these things and the team's raising all these issues. We've got to fix all of them. Have the conversations, then you can prioritise which things you focus, which, what's going to give you the best return on your time and energy. Which points at uh, one of the facilitation superpowers is uh, to make a synthesis. Yeah. Um, and to really boil it down to what is actually the essence of what has happened yeah. instead of getting lost in the minute details. That's right. Yeah. And yes, it needs, uh, I think it, there's a good portion of talent in it, but also of practice. Yeah. Um, to distinguish, okay, what is just a random idea? <laughs> <laughs> what is just an outlier? That's <laughs> some <right>. noise. <laughs> um, yeah. And because we've done it so much, we've seen so many of these things play out. We've seen, we've got trust in the process because we've seen it mm. work. You know? yeah. We've seen it work. And so we know that it will work. We don't have, uh, I don't think I get the panic or to capture everything because I know I've seen this play out and I know we go through the process and we let the stuff set and it will it will work by the end. I don't need to, I know this has happened more and more over time. I don't need to overmanage things. I can just trust that once the you know foundations are there, we'll get to a good outcome. And I, so yes, we trust the process because we've been there mm. and we designed the process. Yeah. <laughs> so we better trust it. It better work. Yeah. <laughs> how do how do we get the team leaders of the client then to trust the process? Yeah. Uh, th- so this is a good question as well. And I think I think this plays to a I think what's an important role for externals coming in and uh, uh, b- building that self sufficiency is just showing what good looks like as well so actually going in and going look be a participant in a really good facilitated workshop just see it in action see it work and you do i think by doing that you do see the aha moments go where it's like ah yeah okay actually i don't need to meddle or intervene as much i can Mm. and i think especially in those sessions if there's time for it to go to that meta level okay forget what we worked on at the workshop level think about how the workshop was run what did you like what did you dislike what worked and what didn't and almost always it will come Back to the things that people liked were things like not, be, you know, having the chance to have input, seeing it all kind of come together, s- seeing the chance to hear everyone's opinions, all those things that we try and do in a good facilitative process. Um, and so sometimes that results in those light bulb moments yeah. as well. It's actually seeing it work is really handy. And I'm um, coming back full circle to where we started. Would you then also reflect on the personality types? So how someone has played the games or how how does it manifest in the game and does it actually match the map that we drew at the beginning? So you mean in terms of the team types and yeah. where someone sits? I, I definitely think there is a... Um, it's, a, it's the funny thing about games, um, probably less the games that I've developed, but like if you, let's say we use other types of games... I find it, you immediately see, I think there's a quote, I'm going to butcher the quote, but it's something like you learn more about someone in an hour of play than a, than a lifetime of other stuff. It's to- I've totally butchered the quote, but I love the essence of it, which is basically you watch someone play a game and you'll learn a lot about their personality yeah. very oh, yes. quickly. <laughs> how competitive someone is. How, how they collaborate, how they yes. talk, how they communicate, yeah. all these things. Within and I play loads of video games with my friends, and it's so funny. Like our core personality comes out in how we, how yeah. we play games online. It's 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 funny. It's very 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 funny. Um, and I think the same applies. Uh, so less so my games because they're not that style of game. But if they're playing other games, you could quickly see their personal tendencies come out, um, <laughs> and you could then match up quite quickly. Ah, that's how you played the game, and this is what the personality assessments told us. And yeah, and I think if you can can have this type of conversation 
lightheartedly so that it doesn't become a finger pointing or blaming game, but rather, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> because it's not good or bad if someone is overly. C- I have friends, they are so competitive. <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to play a board game with them because it's all about winning. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm one of those people. Well, I've worked a lot on that aspect to lessen it. But if you put me into a high stakes game, that trait rises <laughs> up very fast. Interesting. I remember so I those yeah. type of people. Yeah. And I think, yes, we do change. I remember as a kid, I would <laughs> at some point just sit under the table and be like, I don't want to play this game anymore. <laughs> Ever again. I <laughs> just kind of wipe it all out. <laughs> I hate this game. This game's rubbish. <laughs> yes. <It's laughs> Um, but I think the interesting thing is, like, if I kind of just personal reflection, it's um, I love games where we're working as a team mm. competitively. So I think that's where, because I love the team. I like I just you know soccer is my primary um, primary sport, and the magic is when the team works collectively together and it's happening in full flow. The team is just connected. It's it's magic. Mm. it is magic and it's the same when you're playing kind of uh, even online video games there'll be moments with the team you're just connecting you look for whatever circumstances have happened and it's awesome it's like wow this is like a it's really cool how we're collaborating as a team to work together that feeling is is really special and it works really well that's i think the magic of of teamwork yeah this community spirit yeah. the sense of belonging and having a clear part yes yeah and achieving something yeah. Awesome that um wouldn't be possible without the team coming together in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can then shift it, lift it to the to the work as a team and how this translate to the business. Mm. Magic. And it's pure magic, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Feels like an end. <laughs> Oh, we've spoken for almost one and a half hours. Oh, good. Oh, wow, that's that. <laughs> wow. Is there anything that you would have liked to mention or voice that we haven't touched upon yet? Oh, good question. I think um, I think we've covered such a good range of different different things and different aspects. Um, I like that we've explored the like the grey area as well. So I can't I can't think of anything that's kind of jumping to mind that we haven't spoken about that I'm keen to get off my chest. I have one more curiosity if yeah. we do have the time. Go for it. What got you into designing games? <laughs> <laughs> Just a minor question. Yeah. Well Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have we got time to unpack this? <laughs> Oh, no, I think it's a pretty, this was a pretty, um, it's a, this is an easy one to answer because I've been playing games since a very young age, board games with my family, video games from a young age, very lucky to, I've got a games console, then a PC, you know, at the age of kind of six or seven and like immediately hooked into games so that there's something about games which matches very mm. nicely with the things I value, like, you know, valuing fun value valuing achievement like games have just got those things baked into them um so games that immediately hooked me from a really young young age um and then i think just the bringing it into the workplace context i think especially the facilitation context i just i think i was must be experimenting around with with stuff and i must have experimented with, oh, let's let's use games in a facilitation setting and it was amazing. You know, sometimes, especially as an early facilitator, you do stuff and the group doesn't give you much back. And it's, that can be quite difficult. Yeah, what do I do? Anyway, I must have run a game one time and just gone, the whole room just like lit up with conversation. Like mm-hmm. it was just like, wow, I just literally all I've done is introduce some instructions and the room has erupted and everyone's in this deep, meaningful conversation. And I think in my head that must have been a seed to go, this is pretty mm-hmm. awesome. Games obviously can do something pretty magical. That it's hard to do otherwise. Anyway, that that would have happened, and then I think when I got to starting my own business um, four years ago, I'd started with pretty much a blank page. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna 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 focus on here. And over the four years, it's just ended up becoming that it's a game led game led mm. business now, just from experimenting with different ideas, um, 
I think the beautiful thing about running your own business as well, you get really close to your identity. You get closer to your identity. What do you value? How do you like to do things? And I think it just, you know, I've studied sports psychology. I love board games. I've worked in business psychology. It's like, what's the intersection of all these mm. things? And it just seems like the obvious answer, which is build games that help teams. Like it's, uh, yeah. it just ended up happening. And I ran some experiments in that space um, at the start of the pandemic. And again, that just va validated this is the angle that I should oh. go down and pursue. Um, yeah. Sports psychology. So I, we could have followed this tangent and even further. <laughs> even, <yeah. laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> tangent alarm. I know. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I love a tangent as well. So <laughs> and the, this magic moment of a tangent that it's still touching Just the topic. Yes. And otherwise it's a deviation, it's right? Yeah. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> otherwise it's a distraction, but the tangent is a beautiful moment. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so cool to be in a real studio and seeing each other. It's amazing. I mean, I've got quite uh, other, co like we, we've done one, um, I don't know, we're kind of coming up to time as well, but uh is the experience different for you doing it in person versus yes. remote? Yes. And if yes, what's the... Because this is a question I'm trying to still also... There's something about being in person. How do we... What's the what's the, what's the thing? Because I, I, I... Yeah. I think it's a synchronicity. Yeah. So we can laugh and speak at the same time without taking airtime away from each other, literally. Mm. Because on Zoom, there's only one who can speak. Yeah. And I think there is this holding back. And I think so the conversation can be faster mm. and it's easier to read the body language, I think. Very interesting. Yeah. So yeah. I think this is um, thinking just about the future, you know, thinking about um, facilitation the future and I think how do we kind of have some of those things. Mm. And I've obviously I've got a big interest in technology as well and, um, you know, what role does it think things like VR, AR play in facilitation? And it's a, yeah, it's interesting whether. On the other hand, yeah. if I may, yeah, I think in a facilitated process or a group conversation, maybe you do want to slow it down. Mm. Because you don't want people to speak over each other and to have this. I think in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, the podcast, it's really nice because it gets this extra energy. Yeah. But then in a team, especially if you have a team of introver of extroverts, yes. <laughs> you don't want all <laughs> of them to speak at the same time. And that's a nice thing of online. online. It's a, it, uh, this is a super small sample size, but I looked at all my data um, and I cut it based on in-person versus fully in-person versus fully remote. And the... Um, one of the areas that had the biggest difference was a feeling of inclusivity, which was higher online than in person. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, so yeah, it's a small sample size, but um, I think there's some... I totally buy yeah. that. I think the the level of inclusion and rotating and having everyone to speak with everyone else, yeah. nobody listening, I think it's yeah. it's magic. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. That was a relevant tangent. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.